Okay, good morning. Welcome at another exciting day at Drupal Camp. Um, I'm going to talk about secure Drupal development. My name is Steven van den Hout. I'm a Drupal developer at Calibrate. You can follow me on Twitter with at StevenVDHout and my Drupal.org username is SVDHout. While I was preparing for these slides, I asked myself, is Drupal secure? And to answer that, to answer the question, is Drupal core secure or are contribute modules secure? You first need to answer the question, is open source secure? Because people used to believe in security by obscurity, which means that if a hacker can't view the code, it's harder for him to find a bug, an issue he can use to hack your site with. But it is easier for a hacker to find uh, a bug in open code. It does not make it easier for hackers either, anyway, because open source makes people look at code. It forces the reviews on your code. And the more people look at your code, like at Drupal.org, the more people will post reviews and critical bugs. So I believe I can say that bad open source software is as bad as bad private software, just with the difference that people will report issues when they come along. I know, don't know if every, anybody ever heard of OWASP. That's the Open Web Application Security Project. And they make all kinds of neat apps you can use when you're learning and developing about security. And one of the things they do at each year, they list uh, the 10 most used vulnerabilities inside websites uh, that are used for by hackers. And this is not a complete list, but uh, things that come back every year are SQL injection, cross-site scripting, uh, cross-site request forgeries, uh, access bypass and stuff like that. And later on in the session, I'm going to talk about these vulnerabilities and what Drupal APIs do to help you secure your site against these threats. So if you look at these line charts, the red bars stand for Drupal core, the blue lines stand for contributed modules, and you'll see that there are a lot of reported vulnerabilities, either way, as well for Drupal core as for Drupal country, but that, that doesn't mean that Drupal is not secure. As I said, the more issues are reported, the securer your product gets. You do see that there's a significant difference between core and contract modules and the reported issues that there are. So that means you have to think about which contract module you're going to use. Not Don't you use any module, make a wise choice. But yes, I believe Drupal is secure. Why? Because it's safe by design. There's a really good security team and they created definitely good APIs we can use to build secure modules and secure websites. A security team inside a big open source project, I think that's unique. And the security team is highly organized, which means that they have a well-documented process for how security advisories are written and how people manage the path from a security issue that gets reported until the patch that actually is deployed to the module and your website. And it's not only the latest version of Drupal that's supported, but it's the latest version and the version before. So for now, the Drupal 6 and Drupal 7 when Drupal 8 ships, uh, support for Drupal 6 will be dropped. Uh, but if a specific module maintainer believes he should also keep track of Drupal 6 updates, he's allowed to do so. So we can pretty much say that Drupal is a secure product, but it's really important that you keep your Drupal website secure. And I can't say this enough, security is a process. It's not an event. You have to make sure your code stays up to date. Because if you take a look at the security release cycle, great graphics by Akia, by the way, uh, once a vulnerability in code is discovered, it gets reported privately to the security team, which means that nobody knows but the security team and the guy who reported the vulnerability. Then the security team gets together, they review the issue, think about whether or not it's influential for the core and other contract modules as well. And then if they find that the threat is valid, they get to the module maintainer, they notify him and they ask him to help build a fix for it. So it's the maintainer's job to fix the issue, but he gets a lot of support for the security team when needed. When the maintainer has fixed the issue, this issue fix gets reviewed by the security team. They're going to look, did the fix create any other security holes for other modules or Drupal core? And when they all agree that it's a valid patch and there are no more problems, it gets patched and created uh, with simple tests. And only then, when they're really sure that the bug is safe and it's fixed, 
Only then there will be a security advisory written and published on websites and newsletters. And from that point on, everybody knows that there's a security issue that has been fixed. And it's up to us as site builders, developers, to make sure that we keep track of up-to-date code. So if it's a private disclosure, you're safe until the release of the security update because it's easy for hackers to find out which version of Drupal you're using, for example. And if they see you're using Drupal 7.16, then you can just look up on the internet what vulnerabilities does this version have and how can I hack it. So you have to update as fast as possible. And how do you do that? Well, it's pretty easy. If you're using Drush, then you can use command line to update all your modules at once <coughs> and test it. Uh, if you're on a maintenance project you took over from another client and you're not really sure if modules that have been used have been patched or not, you can use the hacked module uh, combined with the diff module and then you can see if there are any changes made to the original version of that module. So there's no need to worry about updates because you don't know if it's patched or not. This is the standard Drupal update manager. If it's core, you can just click it when you install your Drupal and it will tell you when new modules are available or new security releases are posted. It can even send you an email. But there are way better tools to monitor your site. There are tools like Droptor, Nagios, Drupal Monitor. They all have their own Drupal project module which you can use to integrate with your website. And if you're using Akia Cloud Hosting, you also have Akia Insights. And this looks like this, I think that's the most well-designed uh, monitoring tool. It gives you a score based on your performance, security, uh, best practices that's done. And they give you really good tips on how to keep your site secure and they keep you posted on new releases as well. So we know how to keep our site secure, then it's time to build one. And if you're building a Drupal website, most of the time we're starting off with choosing contributed modules. And I mentioned before, Contributed modules do have a high risk of vulnerabilities. They are constantly monitored by all the users on Drupal.org, but not every module has as much users as any other. So it's good to have good quality assurance. And to make sure that the module has good quality, I usually check the usage. How many times has it already been used? You can see that underneath the project download link. But I also check how many open issues does the project have. And what's the ratio between open and closed issues? Because one open issue is not, a, not much, but there are, there are only two issues, it's 50%. Another good indicator is response time in the issue queue. If anybody files a bug, how long does it take before the maintainer answers back or fixes the bug? And good quality usually means good security. So you can pretty sure, be pretty sure if a module is a lot used that it's good stuff. But if you're not sure or if you want to use a module that's really specific and only has a couple of users, I suggest you do a manual code review. Uh, you'll learn a lot from looking at other people's code and you're sure that there are no less security risks. So as I said before, keep up to date and use Drush Up for updates. And I talked about the hacked module to see whether or not a module is patched. But you shouldn't actually use that, because when you have good patch management, you make sure that you're always up to date with what modules are patched. So if you ever are in the case you need to apply a patch, and you find one in the issue queue, I suggest that you read the entire issue. Because sometimes at comment number 10, somebody filed an, a patch for your problem, and it's listed green, so you think, yeah, I can go ahead. And then there were underneath 50 comments that say, no, no, no or it's going to infect this or that. Uh, don't just click the first link you see, read the entire issue queue first. If you have written an, your own custom patch to solve a problem, commit it back to the community. You're helping out a lot. It's really good for maintainers, but you're also getting feedback from maintainers and other users. They might see issues with your hack that you haven't seen yourself. And in the best case, your patch that you've, hit, you've had will get committed to the module itself, which means that when you're doing an update, your patch will already be there. So there's no need to manually create the patch again every single release. If you're supplying patches, good patch management is a good idea. So what I do, I always move a patched module to a different folder, not in the contrib folder anymore, but in the patched folder. This way Drush will know that it's patched and it won't get updated by Drush up. I created patches.txt where I subscribe the problem 
and the fix a link to Drupal.org. Uh, and I keep always keep the patch within the folder myself. I don't know why, but that's the thing I do. And then the, the good part, building custom modules. And building custom modules, it's really easy. You don't really have to be worried uh, about security issues as long as you're using the APIs from Drupal properly because they ensure you your module is, is secure. They have the security pyramid and when a user visits a page, the pyramids of different security layers go passes from bottom to top. So first of all, you have menu or node access, which gets the idea of, can this user actually see the content I'm providing? Uh, menu access for simple pages, node access while we're listing a view with different nodes. Then these, this access layer will already make sure a user doesn't see stuff he's not supposed to see. Next on top of that, the form API, if a user gets to submit the form or something, we'll make sure that no malicious JavaScript code gets inserted in the post variables. And they have some APIs you can use to make sure that no dirty stuff is included with your form. And we are writing to the database. The database abstraction layer has its ways of preventing SQL injection. And then it's the smallest segment, but the most important one, the team functions and proper filter functions make sure that the malicious code that gets inserted in your web page don't come out so that no malicious JavaScript gets run. So let's take a look at these hacks I've just saw, shown you and what's the Drupal solution for them. First of all, SQL injection. I think that's a cartoon by uh, XKCD and it really explains to me what SQL injection does. Because if you see the select query underneath, select star from user where name is, and you see that the variable is directly included in the query. So if the user then submits his name as Robert semicolon drop table students, the students table will drop because the first query will be run and then the next query will be executed if you're not using the Drupal database abstraction layer properly. And it's not really hard to database exception layer. You can just use DB query and uh, your own query as before. Only you cannot use the variable directly inserted in the query, but you have to use placeholders, colon user. And in the query function, you can then supply an array with all the placeholders you're using. This way, Drupal will make sure that all uh, SQL injection stuff gets cut out of the query before it's run. Another good idea uh, is using dynamic queries. That's a little bit more advanced. It might have a little performance issue uh, on selects, but if you're doing inserts or delete queries, then you might be better off using dynamic queries. And I go, as you see there, with different methods on the DB select object. A really big bug is cross-site scripting. That's uh, executing arbitrary JavaScript codes on the page. So somebody, a hacker, uh, posts a comment with a JavaScript link inside and because he's not logged in, that's no problem for him. But when I, as user one, log in afterwards, if the JavaScript code gets run, he's able to do pretty much anything. Because anything you can do, as, as user one or anybody, JavaScript can do better and faster because they're allowed to take over your session and they can easily submit forums and stuff. So that's really important to watch out. And you just have to make sure you don't trust user input. And user input is not just what people submit in a forum. Uh, it's a title or a body, but it can also be log messages. Uh, people can be fiddling with the URL or they can change the post call that's been made to your form. But it's also possible to change the browser's user agent uh, or headers you're submitting to the website. And there was this module uh, that just created a list of all user agents that visited the site. And if an administrator went to the list, it just, would just spit it out without proper API functions. And that way, if anyone ever uh, changed his user agent status to be HTML, it would get inserted in the website and it was a security threat. And it's pretty easy to fix. Um, First of all, when you're submitting forms, you have to validate them. Make sure that no malicious stuff gets in. Uh, 
first of all, when Drupal renders a form, it builds a sort of cache from the same form. And when Drupal then later on submits the same form, it creates this, the same hashed version of that form and compares it to the first one. So if anybody with JavaScript or anything inserted extra fields or stuff, or extra uh, options to a select field, Drupal will notice and will tell immediately that it was an, uh, an Ill illegal operation. Uh, it makes it a little bit harder to write AJAX-based forms, but there are APIs for that as well. But the most important thing to know about forum API is that you should never use the post super variable, because that's where people can insert uh, funny stuff. You just Drupal already filters the post variable and inserts them in your form state values uh, parameter. So if you're using that, then the post stuff will not get inserted. And it's not really just what goes in with the form submits, it's not what goes in Drupal, it's what comes out, what gets rendered to the screen. And anything that's not trusted has to be properly formatted when it returns or when it goes back to your page. So I suggest you never use full HTML uh, as a filter format for your clients, because although JavaScript codes might be uh, filtered out, there are a lot of other issues that can inform. I always use the, the default filtered format for clients, and I just give them extra text if they're needed. Also, if you're writing custom code and you're printing something to the screen, uh, make sure you use the filter functions like check URL, check plane, check markup, filter XSS. And with this diagram, you'll see how it works. So you have to ask yourself, is this piece I'm showing on the screen a URL? Yes, then I'm using check URL filter function. If it's just plain text, no HTML text or whatsoever, we're using check plane. If there are some HTML text allowed, which you just submit like filtered HTML, we're using check markup. And if it's plain HTML, like the full HTML uh, filter format, we're using filter XSS. XSS. That way only uh, malicious XSS stuff gets uh, excluded when you're showing it on the screen. And only when you're really sure that your, the variable you're rendering to the screen can be fully trusted, it's allowed to print it directly. But even for that, you're, you're probably going to use uh, the T function because you would want to translate it afterwards. And if you're using the T function, it will also uh, go past check plane. Uh, you have to notice that if you're using these placeholders inside your T function with an ampersand or a percentage sign, they will be rendered as plain text. But if you're using the exclamation mark uh, variable, then it will be rendered as full HTML uh, as is. So you probably should never use the exclamation mark placeholder. If you're using the link function, the L function, it will also be passed to check URL. And if you're doing other stuff like Drupal set title, even then Drupal will make sure the check plane is run so no crazy shit gets rendered to your site. Cross-site request forgery. That's a thread that happens when it's possible to take an action without confirming intent. So that means if you click something and the action is done and nothing, you don't have to uh, agree or something. So I have, you see here, a simple link which deletes user one. It's a crazy idea to provide a link for that, but you could. And if you click it, user one gets deleted, no questions asked, it's just done. If anybody knows about that URL and he posts an image, and let's say a comment, the image will be shown, the path of the source will be uh, looked up and the user will get deleted. And that's, uh, might seem a crazy idea to do when it comes to deleting user one, but there used to be an uh, issue with views, and it was possible to disable a view by just clicking the link, disable it. And that way, a hacker which submitted an image tag could easily disable all the views of your website, and that could be a <laughs> disaster. So to solve this problem, it's really easy. You have to use uh, Drupal get token, but what that does is you call in Drupal get token and you give it a random string, you can choose anything you want. And then it uses the hash you've submitted uh, within your settings.php file and some other stuff to create a token specific for this page call. It's specific for this call and also for the session, so it can be copied to other pages. And if you're performing the action, you have to check if this token is valid first. 
and you just give the receive token as the parameter and the same string you chosen before to create it. This way, uh, cross-site request forgery is pretty much out of the picture. One of the most things that happened uh, is access bypass. And that's pretty much if somebody can see anything on your site, he's not supposed to see. And that may not be a security issue, but if a user is not allowed to see uh, notes at its own proper note page, it is not uh, themed on that page and stuff, it's not supposed to happen. So you have to make sure that uh, you, your content does not, is not seen by users that are not allowed to. Um, let's say we're creating our own custom block which lists nodes. So we're doing a, a query on the nodes table and we're getting uh, some fields and we're showing them on the screen. That query will just get all queries, all nodes that are within the where function of your uh, database query. But it will not get rewritten. And in Drupal 6, we used to have Drupal rewrite SQL. And Drupal rewrite SQL rewrites your SQL so that you could add a text additional parameter for filtering on access permission for say. And if you're using the add tag uh, methods in Drupal 7, you can do the same thing. So what you have to do, if you want to manually create a query that lists uh, nodes or users, uh, you add a tag with the base table you want to rewrite the query on. And if you do add tag nodes access, only uh, nodes that this user allowed to see will be shown when returning that query. That way, uh, the query will only show you nodes the user is allowed. But if you're implementing custom caching on the same form, because it might be a heavy uh, call or something, and you've written your own cache implementation, and you're, you're looking at your page as user one, which can see all the nodes, the blocks get cached, and if an anonymous user later on visits the same page again, he will see the cached version of the node he's not allowed to see. So if you're doing custom caching, uh, you have to keep in mind to add the role ID uh, to your caching table so that it's uh, specific for certain roles and not for all users at once. When it comes to looking at node pages themselves, let's say we have a carousel on the home page with a specific content type which we can use to uh, add images and text inside the carousel. Uh, the user can also visit node slash and then the node ID path to look at that page. And that will always be visible defaultly. But then you have the rabbit hole module, which allows you to create a default setting for each content type and to say uh, if a user visits the node, node page, what do we need to do? Can we just show it? Can we show it for everyone or just certain roles? Uh, it's possible to give back access the night or uh, even a page redirect to a function you've submitted yourself. And then when a node gets created, you can easily override the same default settings so you can specify on a node-specific base what uh, the behavior of the node page itself should be. The same stuff is possible with Page Manager uh, that comes with the Chaos Tool Suite. It's a bit harder to configure and a bit more work. Another thing to keep in mind when you're working with custom forms that you can use uh, custom access callbacks on fields or form elements by supplying the access parameter on the form. So even a Drupal form or something from a node form, you can just form alter it and set the access of a certain field to false to make sure nobody can see it. And for menu access goes the same thing, you can add a custom access callback to many items you created yourself, but it's also possible to use hook menu alter to make sure that certain pages are only visible for specific sets of users and stuff like that. So what do we need to remember about custom module development and uh, ways of Drupal handling? The only thing you really have to know is the proper use of the Drupal APIs. When it comes to forms, it's about validation uh, and knowing that Drupal valid token exists to prevent cross-site request forgery. The database abstraction layer uses placeholders or dynamic queries to secure uh, against SQL injection. 
And you can use the add tag method to rewrite your SQL based on the node access table. And the most important one, the filter functions, uh, it's not really hard to use, you just have to use them. Functions check URL, check plane, check markup, filter accesses, and they will also come with functions like TL and Drupal set title. <coughs> the most used place for a hacker to uh, hack your site will come to the theming layer. So it's important that you keep your team secure as well. And I believe that's not really the teamer's responsible responsibility because a teamer should never write any logic inside its templates or its code. It's up to the developer to make sure he uses correct preprocess functions to uh, render variables inside a renderable array that the teamer can use. And in the preprocess functions, you as a developer have to make sure you use check plane or other filter functions to make sure that the variable a teamer can print is always safe. And I hate to say this, but you can write and code as secure as you want. It's all going to waste if you're having bad configuration. Because if a guy like Joe from advertising can give the full HTML filter to an anonymous user, don't bother doing security, your site is going to get hacked. So you really have to think about security and permission management, not just for your anonymous user. Your clients can screw things up as well. And one of the things you might want to do for that is split up your permission system because the default permissions don't cover every use case. And I have an example of this page where we wanted uh, an administrator user. We gave them administrator user uh, permission so that he could create and delete users and manage them. But we didn't want him to actually change the user's fields. We didn't want him to use the field API to add fields on the user's page and stuff. And when you're giving administer users permission, a user is allowed to do that. So what we did, we uh, created with hook permissions our own permissions. And then as I said before, with hook menu alter, we just added a custom access argument on the specific page, uh, which is used to supply filters to a user, fields to a user. And then these filter formats again, this time not in code, but the filter formats you use to on fields like text areas and body fields inside your Drupal uh, node, for example. Uh, I would never use full HTML, but use filters with added parameters. And never, ever, ever use PHP filter. It may sound really useful, but there's really no reason to do so. Anything you can do with PHP filter, you can do inside a custom model module. This way, at least your code is versioned and you can roll back uh, problems if you have some. But also, the PHP filter uses the eval method uh, to parse this string as PHP and execute it, and that's really bad for performance. So just figure out how you have to do it in custom code. It's not, not really hard and way better for your site. So to round up, I've added uh, a checklist. Uh, the most important things, never use PHP filter or full HTML as a filter format. Uh, give the needed permissions to trusted users only and split them up if, if needed. And if you're writing custom stuff, use the correct API functions. Remember to use preprocess functions to give variables to your theming layer. Use check plane and these filter functions to make sure no bad JavaScript code gets written to the screen. Use a database abstraction layer as it's supposed to, farm API. Remember these tokens to prevent cross-site request forgery and give attention to your node access ways so that anonymous users don't never get to see nodes that they're not allowed to. So great, we all know a bit, pretty much the basics on secure Drupal development for Drupal 7 at least, but how about Drupal 8? And that's good news, Drupal 8 implements the same filter functions and the same way of handling security as Drupal 7 does. So check plane and all these important functions will just remain. It's going to be a little bit different way of writing your module. So it's going to be object oriented with controllers and real difficult stuff for beginners. But the, the filter functions itself will remain the same and the use will remain the same. So you should be able to keep on writing secure code in Drupal 8 without really investigating the topic further.
If you do want to know more about Drupal security uh, and you want some further reading, I'd suggest you read Cracking Drupal. That's the best book on Drupal security. Uh, it's not, not expensive. You can buy it online for, I think, 15 euros or something. Uh, and that pretty much handles everything Drupal does to make sure a site is secure. Uh, I'll keep, post my presentation online uh, in a minute. And then you'll have some links to really good write-ups about security as well. Uh, writing secure code on the Drupal.org page is the main page you're going to visit to start with Drupal security. And uh, I've added links to some other talks about security. Uh, I've seen, on, seen one in Denver and Munich. And I don't see it standing in between here, but Akia has also written a really good security report. I think it's called triplesecuritypager.org. Um, I'll find out later and I'll post it with when I'm submitting my sessions. So that's pretty much what I wanted to tell you about writing secure code and the basics of it. So if anyone has any questions, you can ask. Or if you want to go into a specific use case, you can contact me on our booth uh, inside the lobby. You can talk about it if you want. Any questions?